This content is not suitable for children and may contain depictions of violence. Hi, I'm your host, Cambo. Grab a beer and pull up a deck chair. This is True Crime Island, another true crime podcast. And I'm sorry for leaving you hanging this week, on a, especially on a two-part episode. Oh, it was just a perfect storm of things that I couldn't get this produced, this second part of the Jennifer Pan story. So let's get stuck straight into it then. Last week, we went over the Jennifer Pan case, as you know, and if you haven't listened yet, then maybe pause, go back before you listen to this second and final part. Now, we left off with 24-year-old Jennifer Pan being interviewed for the second time on the 10th of November 2010. Now, that was just two days after the home invasion that killed her 53-year-old mother, Bick, and seriously wounded her 57-year-old father, Han. Now, Jennifer's brother, Felix, was away at the time at uni, and Jennifer escaped the attack unharmed. Now, Han was still in a coma, and sadly, on the 10th of November, Bick Han's father died at the ripe old age of 102. Although he was having health problems, you can't help but think that the murder of his daughter hastened his passing. Now, we heard also how Tiger parenting had restricted what Jennifer could and couldn't do who she could hang out with, and that she couldn't have a boyfriend. Well, at least the one she wanted, Daniel Wong. Although she got around these restrictions by lying to her parents about school, university, jobs, and where she bought it. So, tonight I reference the Edmonton Journal, the National Post, York Regional Police Interview Tapes, the Vancouver Sun, and the book, A Daughter's Deadly Deception, by Jeremy Grimaldi. And I suggest to get the ultimate detail in this, have a read of that. Now, I normally don't go into such depth in regards to the interviews, but this time I thought they were fascinating. So yeah, this episode is a little bit different on how I normally go about things. I'll basically go through the interview bit by bit and pull out the more relevant parts and how it all unfolds in the end. So we pick up where Jennifer hasn't gone back to her home at 238 Helen Avenue, Markham, Unionville, Ontario, 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 I don't know, and is staying with her auntie. Now, she's called in for her third interview on Monday the 22nd of November 2010, a couple of weeks after the home invasion, and the interview is being held at 5 District Station, Markham, and the interview commences at 2.41pm. Conducting the interview is Detective Bill Gates. Now, that's G-O-E-T-Z, not Bill Gates, the Microsoft guy. And he describes himself as being the guy that looks over all of the investigation and tries to find out where things don't quite add up, where maybe statements from witnesses conflict or it looks like someone hasn't told the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So her first interview was in the early morning of the 9th of November. That was just hours after the home invasion. And the second interview was held on the 10th of November. So that's the next day. That interview was, as I said, just hours after that home invasion. And the police had to get as much information out of their only real witness, even though Jennifer had just undergone a traumatic event. At this stage, Jennifer was seen as a victim So they conducted the interview with with as much compassion as they could while still being able to get a basic rundown on what happened and descriptions, of course, of who did it. The second interview, though, and that's just the day after, had a totally, totally different tone. At this stage, investigators were actually split on whether or not she was the victim or the perpetrator. It is early days, but things just didn't add up with what Jennifer had told them the day before. By the time we get to this third interview conducted by Bill Gates, it's almost two weeks after the home invasion, and Han Pan, Jennifer's father, is now out of a coma, and he's given his version of events. Now, right from the start of this interview, Jennifer is crying with her head in her hands, and this will happen all the way through this interview. 
Gates asked her what her understanding was of her previous sworn video statement agreement and that she swore not to lie. Now, straight off, Gates also tells her that if she had anything to do with the homicide, she could be charged with murder. So they're sort of onto something there. He tells her that she doesn't have to talk and can get a lawyer, but again, no lawyer and she talks. Also, she's not under arrest and can stop the interview and walk out at any time. Now, probably what she should have done, lawyer up, shut the fuck up and get the fuck out of there. But she didn't. I think really she thought it was better for her to go through with this interview and that she could probably lie her way through it like she did with the last couple. Now, Gates starts by asking to describe herself and her background history and what she wants to do in the future. Now, I reckon this is just to get some sort of rapport with Jennifer, as they'd only just met, he hadn't interviewed her before, and also to get some sort of baseline in regards to her body language and how she speaks to him on matters that she has no reason to lie about at all. He also brings up Daniel and their relationship. And with this, I think he seems to be building up how restricted Jennifer was by her parents, especially how they forbid her, forbade her to see the love of her life. And to probably start to try and infer that she had hostile feelings towards her parents, which in turn could be seen as motivation for her to harm them. Now, he also brings up whether she told her parents the truth about the relationship. Now, Jennifer tells Gates that she did have to lie to her parents about Daniel. And this had gone on for years, as they had been seeing each other for about seven years. Then, as they go on, it's discovered that Jennifer has a third SIM card. Now, as we found last episode, she started off with one phone, then that turned into one phone and a second SIM card, which then turned into two phones and two sims, and then three phones. And now they're three phones and three sim cards. Now, this doesn't look good when you hold back this sort of information from investigators. It looks dodgy as fuck, and maybe you're trying to hide something from them. Now, Jennifer is then asked about the last time she talked to her dad, and she tells Gates that it was at the hospital. She tells Gates that her father asked if Daniel was behind the invasion, and Jennifer said she didn't think so, but she couldn't be 100% sure. I mean, what the fuck does that mean? You would really want to just answer with a definite no, not a maybe type of answer. And at this stage, it looks like Jennifer's lies are starting to come around and bite her on the ass. Now, Gates starts asking her about her friends and not her scummy drug dealing friends, but the friends her parents were okay with. And she's very confident when she talks to him. She's just facing him, talking, no problem. Now, asked if she has any black friends, and she says no. So at this stage, they're trying to see if she's lying because they already know a lot more than she's letting on. That then they know a lot more about what's going on than she's letting on from cross-referencing not only her phone records, but those of her friends, especially the scummy ones. Although they'd spoken to Jennifer's relatives, they told police that they'd seen her talking to some black guys in a friendly manner shortly before the attack, like I think it was a few weeks before. Now, Gates brings up that one of her relatives had told police that she, that she had said that the intruders hadn't killed her because they liked her. Now, Jennifer tries to clarify this by saying, no, they didn't kill her because she cooperated, not that they liked her. So a lot of these things just don't add up, especially to Bill Gates. Now, the cops have gone into this interview very well prepared. They've gone over both her statements and have worked out a strategy on how to proceed with this interview. They're not stupid. And then Gates asks, why didn't they shoot you? Did your parents cooperate? Now, he tells her that they seemed to cooperate. They gave them their money. They did the, as they were told. And it was... How did they not cooperate? At this stage, Jennifer starts to get very nervous as Gates tells her he's just trying to see where they didn't cooperate. She has no real answer. And Jennifer now has her head in her hands and this, like I said, will be pretty much normal for most of the interview. Gates asks her, why tie you up and not your parents? Why not blindfold you? 
It seems odd to him and it didn't make sense to leave a witness behind after shooting her mother and father. Now, often when he asks her questions, she either doesn't answer, shakes her head or whimpers or says, I don't know. Now, Gates then goes over her statements from her previous interviews. Jennifer, head in hands, is bent over with her head in her, right in her knees at this stage. I, now, I think at, at this time, her little mind is racing at about 100 miles an hour, or for Canadians and Australians, 160 kilometres an hour. She knows she's fucked, and there are all these holes in her story, and she will have to remember all the little lies she spread throughout the truth on what she said happened that night. Now, Gates asks about the night of the invasion and asks if the doors were checked as locked. Now, Jennifer says that her mum usually does it and that at the, that time of night, they should have been locked. He goes over how she was tied up and asks her about the description of the home invaders. Now, this stage, Jennifer's looking away, head in hands, crying. She's whimpering, she's saying, I, I told you already. Now, Gates leaves the interview room at this stage for a while and Jennifer seems to know she's fucked. Head in her hands again, into her knees, crying. Now, I think he leaves to get her, let her stew a while and also to get some info from those outside the interview, interview room that are monitoring what's going on. Now, when he comes back, he asks her where she gets her money from and especially where she got the $2,000 she had in her drawer. Okay, so it turns out that her mum does a job on the side. Because she's been unemployed for over a year, but she's got this job where her pay gets made out to Jennifer. Now, it must be some sort of tax avoidance scheme or maybe trying to get some sort of social benefit because Jennifer is studying and living at home. I don't know. But Bix wages are made out to Jennifer. So some of the money was Bix wages that Jennifer had withdrawn from her account to give to her mum, but she hadn't given it to her at that point in time. Or I reckon she withdrew it knowing she needed it that night to pay off her hitman. See, it's unclear how Jennifer would pass on this money to her mum. If she just withdrew the lot each week or month to give her. Or if her mum would just request some of it when she needed it. But a bit rude using your mum's money to organise a hit on her. Now, Gates then tells her he's a truth verification officer, not a detective. I mean, he is a cop. But his role is to look at everything as a whole and to find out where he reckons people aren't telling the truth. Now, he tells Jennifer that withholding information is also not telling the truth. He tells her as he pieces everything together, he works out what is and isn't plausible. He also tells her that he's undergone statement analysis on every witness statement and that he's analysed all of them. He says he's got an app he used called Event Probability Analysis Program. Now, I'm sure there are programs to help in a statement analysis, but Gates didn't use one. In fact, this is where Gates starts to make shit up to try and get a confession. Now, this is permitted by law in Canada. It's called the Reed Technique, where authorities are able to make shit up to get a con confession. We can also do this in Australia, and it worked to great effect to solve the Daniel Morecambe disappearance. Now, that's a case I have done on my audio podcast. If you're interested, maybe a year or so ago, now, there are issues with this technique, as some say it can cause, cause false confessions. But Gates tells Jennifer that things just don't add up. He tells her that by taking DNA samples from the house, he knows who was where and if they were or weren't in a room. Now, yep, there is some truth to that, but the way he was saying it, that even walking into a room for a few seconds, that they can tell because they've got the DNA from every person, animal, whatever, that's ever gone in that room, even for a moment. Then Gates tells Jennifer that they had talked to a lot of people to help verify her story. That is true, but then he goes into satellites. He tells her that they obtained satellite video of the scene on the night and that they were able to use infrared x-ray down into her house that night and watch as events unfolded and how people moved around the house. And Jennifer actually believed him. Then he asked her, who was the last to touch the doorknob? Because if her mother had locked it, her fingerprints would be there. But if somebody later came and unlocked it, their fingerprints would be there, replacing her mum's. Now, Jennifer realises that her fingerprints would be on the doorknob and that she, 
and that meant she was the last to touch it, not her mum. Now, Gates then mentions Crime Stoppers and how they get lots of calls from there. He says that the more people involved in a crime, the more info they get because people talk to people and the people they talk to talk to people and so on. They're just pyramids out. He says often tips are called in by friends of the perpetrators just for the reward money. Even family members will dob people in. So Gates tells her that he has so many resources available to him to check a story. He has all the forensic evidence. He has criminal profilers looking into it. He has so many ways to verify her story, if it's true or not. But Jennifer resists telling the truth. He then does a bit of a good cop thing. He tries to comfort her and he says nothing surprises him. Everybody makes mistakes and that it's best to get it off her chest. He's really implying at this stage that I know you're lying. I know you're lying. Just tell me what happened. It doesn't add up. Now Gates tells her again that she hasn't been truthful and mentions that her dad was there and that he told the truth and that her story isn't truthful. Gates tells, Gates tells, Gates, Gates tells Jennifer that what she said hadn't happened, that many of the, the events she stated didn't happen, that her story doesn't match what her dad said in the interview. Now he goes on that she spent the last seven years not telling the truth. She's been abused by her parents' strictness. He tells her that he knows she's involved and that there's no doubt about it and that he understands why it happened that she was treated like a kid rather than a 24-year-old woman. Just the stress that she must have been under, he could understand that's why she cracked. But Jennifer still resists. She's keeping with her story. And he tells her that he knows she falsified the description of the home invaders and that it's never too late to do the right thing and to stop living the lie and just tell the truth. Now, Jennifer, through most of this, like I said, she's just got her head in her hands. She either just doesn't say a word or just whimpers. It's true, it's true. Then all of a sudden, she says that she wanted it to stop. Okay, what's that mean? But Gates is now starting to get somewhere. Gates tells her that he knows the three men didn't show up to rob the place. They showed up to kill her parents and that they didn't just show up randomly out of the blue either. Then at three hours and 10 minutes into the interview, Jennifer whimpers, it was supposed to be me. I mean, fuck's sake. She's about to change her story, right? But to, she's just going to try and make it fit what she thinks police know. So now she's finally admitting that she knew they were coming, but that she told the men to come and kill her, that it wasn't supposed to happen in the way that it did, and they weren't supposed to kill her. They weren't supposed to kill her parents. They were supposed to come and kill her. She tells Gates that she had organised for a home invasion and that she would pay them $2,000 just to kill her. Now, Jennifer says how she asked a friend, Andrew Montemere, if he knew someone who could do a job. Now, Montemere called his friend Rick, Ricardo Duncan, and he set up a meeting with Jennifer. She asked Rick if he knew anybody who could do this job, this hit. Rick then gave her a number to call. Now, this is where she's given the third phone, the iPhone and SIM card, to conduct all correspondence with the hitman contact. Now, not 100% that way, but we'll just get into that in a moment, who gave her this phone. She said she used this over the next couple of months and that she organised for the three guys to come into the house at night and to kill her. The conversation moved on to the night of the home invasion and how Jennifer had set it up for them to actually get in the house. She said that she got a text that read, game on. Now that was a couple of hours before the event. Gates tell her, tells her that it, she's just telling him half truths because he knows exactly what went down from all the phone records and some security camera footage from over the road from her house. Now Gates tells her that yes, it's true, she got the guys to come to her house, but not to kill her. He mentions to her how they could have killed her anyway. Not at her house. It doesn't make sense to set this up in the house when she could have just walked down the road and could have shot her in the street. Now she does replies that she was never let out. But then he comes back and says, 
well, you were allowed to go out to do your piano teaching and that she could have used that time for someone to pop a cap in her ass. He didn't say that, but someone to kill her. Anyway, Jennifer then explained how she unlocked the door. Her contact texted her VIP access. She wasn't sure what that meant and called them. They replied that they wondered if they could get in. Now, she told them to go to the front door as it is now unlocked. Gates tells her that her dad gave his description of these three guys and that one of the guys was white and no one had dreadlocks, which is totally different to the three black men that Jennifer had described. She's still resisting on this point and tries to sort of keep that lie a lie because she's trying to protect people. He asked her why she hid her cell phone. This is when she got tied up. Now, why do that if you're just expecting to get killed? Now, she keeps saying it was supposed to be her, or it's supposed to be her. She's not really answering his questions. Then Gates just tells her the statistics that this kind of thing happens to 300 families a year, that children can be pushed into corners by their parents, and sometimes the only way they know how to get out of this corner is to kill. He tells her people, family, friends, and the police. They just want her to feel sorry for what she did, to show some remorse. Now, he just keeps telling her he knows what happened and he just wants her to come clean and that her new story that she was supposed to be the target is just untruthful and doesn't make any sense at all. Then there's a knock on the door and Gates goes out. And when he comes back in, he tells her he's arresting her for murder, attempted murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Four hours and 11 minutes into the interview. He then tells her to get a lawyer. Jennifer says to Gates, I thought you were on my side. So this is where the good cop bit the... <laughs> he was being a bit, a bit empathic and a bit compassionate towards her. She thought, actually, he's going to help me get out of this. And obviously, no. He, he was just there to do his job. Now, she clearly looks like she doesn't want to be there, <laughs> as you can imagine, and can't make a decision on getting a lawyer. It's just, just brain is frozen. It's just the reality of this moment that's got her. Now, she empties out her pockets and Gates checks a coat, puts a couple of pads on the table along with her cell phone and $201.07. He leaves and she just sits there motionless with her head down. Okay, so let's get down to what really sort of happened. This Andrew and Rick guy she said she spoke to about the invasion, well, they really weren't involved at all. It would be found that Jennifer did pay, we think, these guys to kill her father in a pre parking lot previously, but they, it looks like they just took her money and nothing came of it. Now, what would be found, and this is through phone records and other investigations, is that Daniel Wong, Mr. Loser Wong, her boyfriend, actually set up Jennifer with a couple of dudes he knew to do the hit on her parents. Now, Daniel gave Jennifer that last SIM card and the iPhone to call a guy named Lenford Crawford, or Homeboy, that was his nickname. Uh, Crawford contacted his mate, Eric Carty, whose nickname was Sniper. Carty then called his mate, David Milva Mil Milvaganam. I can never get that. <laughs> I've got a few emails about this. I can't get his name out. David Milvaganam. David. David Milo, we'll call him. So Daniel and these guys would ultimately be held responsible for this home invasion. Of course, Jennifer was the one who initiated it all. She's the mastermind and ordered the hit. But this is where it all gets a bit weird if it isn't weird already. It would take investigators several months until they were ready to make arrests. In fact, from the 22nd of November when they charged Jennifer, it wouldn't be until mid-April mid 2011 until Daniel Wong, loser Wong, Lenford Crawford, Eric Carty, and David Malvaginam would be arrested. Now, Crawford, Carty, and Milo are all black, but Harpan told police that one of the perpetrators was white. Now, also, Harm would tell police that when he was at gunpoint, Jennifer was taken downstairs, but rather than, as she said, she was tied up and scared, she didn't have her hands bound behind her back, and she seemed to be quite comfortable with the home invaders, even friendly with them. Now, he's not stupid. He realised at the time that she was behind the home invasion 
And what he must have thought as he was marched down into the basement with his wife, had a blanket thrown over his head and her head, and then he heard the first gunshot. He survived only because he turned his head and copped the shot in his face rather than the back of his head. Now he's lucky as the bullet entered his face and travelled down, shattering his neck bone and lodging itself in his neck, missing a vital artery. Anyway, this explains why he ran out the house or left the house rather than check on Jennifer's welfare when all this was going on. You can hear him screaming in the background. He knew she was behind it or he knew she was behind it all. And when he finally came out of his coma, he was able to tell police his version of events. Now, his story didn't match up with Jennifer's, but it made more sense. And to think, she went to his bedside when he woke up and Hart asked her if Daniel may have been involved. So he was suspicious, even coming out of a groggy coma, but probably hoped that Daniel, if anything, may have pressured her into the whole saga. And I wonder what he thought when she asked him for money while he was in his hospital bed with gunshot wounds to his face. I mean, fuck's sake, what he must have been thinking. Now, it wouldn't be until March 2014 that the trial of Pan, Luzer Wong, Cardi, Milo Ganem and Crawford would commence and it would last about 10 months. They all pled not guilty to the charges I mentioned before, first degree murder, attempted murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Now the prosecution, they relied on thousands of text messages between the culprits and especially the hundred or so messages between Jennifer and Lucy Daniel Wong in the hours before the murder. The one text message VIP access that I mentioned before happened at the same time security cameras across the road from Jennifer's house picked up her bedroom light band switched on and then off. And that was a signal that all was clear. They also showed that the home invasion had so many unusual aspects to it. Jennifer wasn't blindfolded, let alone killed. She was left as a witness to the whole thing. Her father, who was supposed to be killed at the time, survived. And he told police a whole different story to that of Jennifer's. Hahn also described that the per perpetrators looked different. One was actually white, not black, and she wasn't tied up during the attack. And she seems to seemed to get along with the home invaders quite well. Now, one strange aspect of it was that investigators were only able to name Mulvaganem as one of the home invaders. The other two... They couldn't quite name, they weren't quite sure who they were. Now, Cardi was apparently the getaway driver, he may have come in, and Crawford and Loser Wong were at work at the time. So whether Cardi, like I said, was also in the house, it's just unknown. But who's this white guy? I have no real idea. It could be one of Daniel Wong's mates for sure. Now, Pan, Wong, my, my Falcon, <laughs> I can't say that word, I can practice it a thousand times off camera and get it perfect, I can't get it on camera. Anyway, him and Crawford, they were all convicted on December the 13th, 2014, and each received a life sentence with no chance of parole for 25 years. Now, Eric Carty, he died in prison in April 2018. So, Islanders, what a strange and tragic case. Tiger parents that only have the best intentions turn their talented daughter into a killer. Now, maybe... That's a bit strong to say that, but they did expect Jennifer to be the best, to excel in her schooling and all the other activities in her life. Now, when Jennifer couldn't keep up with her parents' expectations, she began to lie, forging school reports, which es escalated into lying about graduating high school. And then the flow on from that was lying about attending uni. Jennifer shacked up with her forbidden boyfriend, Luza Wong, Again, lying, saying that she was actually staying with her female friend, Topaz. But as all those lies snowballed, they also started to fall apart. Bit by bit, her parents became suspicious. Jennifer would get busted. She would then give them some half-truths as to what she was actually doing. But then just go back to lying again. As she got older, her parents still had an immense hold on her. The more she broke the rules, the more they locked her down. Now, the only way out for Jennifer, the only way to be with her love, the Mr. Loser Wong, was to do away with her parents. It's the only thing she could see. Now, 
They did have an insurance policy and other assets. So she ended up approaching her drug dealing boyfriend, Daniel, and he organized some hitmen to raid her house and kill her parents. She would collect the insurance, sell the house, split it with her brother and live happily ever after with her lover, Daniel. Problem is, first thing, she hired amateurs, street thug scum. Sure, they're going to pop cap in the ass of anyone for $10,000. But as we see here, it wasn't planned professionally at all. When Harpan woke up from his coma, he was able to give his version of events and they contrast in so many different ways to the virgin, version Jennifer gave to police. But even before he woke up, investigators who do this shit every day, they saw that the home invasion just didn't add up. They soon thought Jennifer was the mastermind behind it. Of course, phone records would help establish the links between Jennifer, Daniel and the other killers. Now, Jennifer didn't even get a story straight before Daniel went in and got interviewed. He ends up telling police that she had mentioned that she wanted her parents dead. I mean, God. Jennifer also thought throwing out a SIM card would mean her messages couldn't be found. But they were still on the iPhone she was given, and police would eventually find that and get all the messages off it. This reminds me of Jody Arias's. Jody Ari Arias. Sticking the camera she'd been taking sex photos of with her boyfriend, Travis Alexander, on the afternoon she killed him. Then she put it in the washing machine after killing him, giving it a wash cycle to erase the memory, which it didn't, and that really did fuck her up. Really, look, Jennifer is an evil little scumbag. She could have just left home. Her parents show also what can happen if you're too hard on your kids. You can send them crazy. Still, they came from a very different background. They just wanted Jennifer to have what they didn't have. So I'm not blaming the victims at all. Their actions just brought out the evil in their daughter. So, Islanders, that's another case gone. As I said last week, if you want more info, read the book A Daughter's Deadly Deception by Jeremy Grimaldi and have a look at Jennifer's interview tapes on, t on YouTube, on TV. So that's the end of another episode. If you want to support the island, there are links in the description for Patreon, PayPal and merch. Please feel free to comment, like and subscribe. And I would truly appreciate it if you share the channel. Hit the bell to be notified because I don't believe about the swearing. And I use words like murder and the YouTube gods don't promote the channel if you say murder and fucking stuff. So your subscription and sharing are really appreciate, appreciated getting more people onto the island. The 1,000 subscriber giveaway is almost open. I'm just going to put a new video in just for all for that. You can just put a comment in there if you want to enter it. T-shirt, and it's, like I said, soap to all subscribers. Well, that's it. I've been your host, Cambo. You've been watching True Crime Island. And as I always say, where's my beer? <laughs> always say that. Don't forget to delete your browser history. Good night and boom vakalanga. Oh, and one thing. Got a couple of days left for the special Bonfire promo t-shirt, which you get links down below if you want to get it. Till the 28th. So, boom, fuck a